so I'd like to uh, uh, welcome uh, Alejandra uh, Albuene. I hope I'm not mispronouncing your, your name there, Alejandra. Uh, Alejandra is a lecturer in the uh, Bartlett uh, School for the Environment, Energy and Resources at, at UCL. Uh, I think by training she's a, a structural engineer and construction historian who's specialised in uh, masonry buildings and heritage conservation and she represents UCL in shock and uh, she's going to, for those unfamiliar with shock, uh, she's going to introduce what shock is all about to everyone. So please go ahead Alejandra. Thank you very much, Julian, for the, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen with you. Let's see uh, how, how that works. Uh, can you see it? Uh, yes. So you're going to go into presentation yes. mode? Yeah. Yeah. yeah great. Perfect. Um, yeah. So um, hello, everybody. And uh, oops. What happened there? there. Hello, everybody, and, and thank you for joining us uh, for this third day of SIADA uh, workshop and first day combined with, with Shock and Iris. Um, I hope you are all doing well and adapting to these uh, new and strange circumstances. Um, as Julian has said, I'm going to introduce uh, Shock, uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud. Um, also, as, um, as Julian has, has already mentioned, I'm an assistant professor or lecturer at the, sustainable, at the Institute for Sustainable Heritage in UCL. And I coordinate our work in the SHOCK project. Um, as a structural engineer, um, my use of digital data, I don't know why this is skipping ahead. Let me go back. Uh, my use of uh, digital uh, data ranges from geometry capture to load and stress analysis. So here's uh, maybe uh, a, a slightly different uh, use of, of data within the heritage uh, context. Um, and, and actually, before, we, and before we, I get started with my presentation, I wanted to add to Julian's introduction that um, as part of uh, the shock feedback um, procedures, uh, I would like to circulate uh, a questionnaire at the end of the event um, and I'd be really grateful if you could fill it in because that will really help us with our, with our reporting. I have planned a short presentation, uh, so there should be time at the end to, to answer any questions if you, if you have any. Um, so, so this slide summarizes the key facts about the SHOCK project. Um, SHOCK is a Horizon 2020 research and innovation action that has the aim of creating the social sciences and humanities part of the European Open Science Cloud, uh, where we will uh, make data tools and training available and accessible for uses of, of social sciences and humanities data. Um, it includes 47 partners and it will be developed over 40 months. Uh, we're currently in the second year of the project. And as part of our objectives, um, SHOCK wants to maximize the potential of reuse of data, which today's workshop uh, is about. Uh, and to do this, we, we, want, uh, we want to promote open science and fair principles. Uh, we want to connect existing and new infrastructures, and we want to establish an appropriate governance model for sustainable uh, sorry, for social sciences and humanities um, within, within the EOSC. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with EOSC or uh, European Open Science Cloud, uh, this is an initiative by the European Commission for developing an infrastructure to provide services promoting open science. There are many components to EOSC and one of them is a series of activities that support the integration and consolidation or thematic infrastructures um, or infrastructure platforms to connect them with EOSC. SHOCK is one of these cluster projects uh, focusing on the social sciences and humanities and there are other, um, other uh, projects, other platforms uh, that focus, uh, they're shown in the slide, that focus in life sciences, environmental research, astronomy and particle physics and photon and neutron uh, research. Um, 
the partners in shock include a number of research, research infrastructures that are, as I was saying, thematically linked uh, to the social sciences and humanities. Uh, all of them are part of the roadmap of ESFRI, uh, the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructure. Uh, some other partners represent stakeholder groups like LIBA, the uh, League of European Libraries, or Trust IT. There is also representation from, research, from the research community with participation of universities and research centers like uh, my own UCL or our host, the University of York. Um, and there are also partners from the technology sector like Semantic Work, Work Company or Center Data. Um, if we were to summarize the work that we're doing in shock, we could say that we are working to transition from disciplinary silos and separate infrastructures within the social sciences uh, and humanities and uh, go into a cloud-based infrastructure for scholars. To achieve this, we are promoting fair data and tools and developing uh, training services. Um, our work covers the entire data cycle and we want to ensure fair principles rule from concept to collection through to analysis and of course also, um, also working on repurposing and archiving which are obviously essential uh, for, for reuse which uh, is our focus today. Um, Shock is working in... Oh, Shock is working in a number of ways to link research communities and infrastructures. On the one hand, we want to engage and empower the research community by interconnecting them and building expertise through training, training networks and events. And on the other hand, we are working with e-infrastructures to promote technical skills like innovation in data access and production and linking technologies and services into the social sciences and humanities cloud. Um, one of the key things that we're doing to achieve this is creating the social sciences and humanities open marketplace where high quality data tools and services will be openly available for data producers and reusers. And alongside this, we will shape and implement governance for fair data that aligns with the EOSC efforts. Um, our objective is to connect with a diversity of stakeholders that engage with the social sciences and humanities in different ways. Stakeholders include universities and researchers, libraries, archives, uh, or even uh, research funders. But we also identify as stakeholders the private sector, policymakers, and civil society in general. Uh, the two main ways that we will engage with, this, with these stakeholders is by offering training and training materials and by also creating uh, opportunities for linking trainer networks and for training trainers. And uh, the other way we will do this is, um, by, is, is through the open marketplace, where as I was saying, we will be sharing tools and data. Um, so as a, as a way of summarizing this introduction to shock, um, I wanted to run through the expected impact of, of the shock project. Um, first, uh, we will integrate social sciences and humanities into EOSC, and that's, and that's uh, one of the primary, primary uh, objectives and, and aims of the project. Um, we will be developing uh, the social sciences and humanities open market and marketplace with, as I was saying, access to tools and data, and we will make high quality and cloud ready tools and high quality data available through this open marketplace. Uh, we want to offer secure access mechanisms for social, uh, for social sciences and humanities data that conforms with EU legal requirements. Um, we will ensure that social sciences and humanities have state of the art research infrastructures. And finally, we, will, we want to maximize data reuse through open science and fair principles. And we will do this by promoting standards, access control, 
semantic uh, techniques or delivering training. Um, and the final thing to say is if you haven't yet done so, please join our community. Uh, you can find uh, a lot more information about Shog uh, online on our website and you can uh, follow the project on Twitter where you, where you will get uh, very regular updates. Um, uh, and yeah, and, and many, thank you, many thanks for listening. And, uh, and if you have any questions, we, we've got a little bit of time to, to address them now. Thanks. I'll okay. stop sharing now. Oh, yeah. Can you put this last slide oh, back up? Sure. Sorry. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I didn't get a screen dump of it. Thank you. And then, uh, Thanks. yeah. Thanks. Hopefully, it's not going to, because it, 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 it moves forward by, it, by itself. So hopefully, it's not going to move. Um, are, there, um, are there any questions right now about this? Or um... Yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Alejandra, for, for that really clear introduction. Uh, perhaps I think Keith's now had a chance to jot, jot down the, uh, the contact details or to take a snap of it, so maybe you can stop sharing Perfect. now. We can uh, see you. Right, thanks. Uh, for those that that don't know Zoom, there's also at the top right, there's also a gallery view so that if you select that you can see uh, more people who are on the call. That's sometimes quite a, a better way of interacting with it. So yeah, thank you for that. So um, I had uh, one uh, question which is is maybe not specifically for, for you Alejandra, but I know we've got quite a few people from uh, Shock and some of the key coordinators and work package leaders who've uh, joined the, the call. And I mean, I partly, I think, know the answer for this, but I wondered if uh, those representing Shock could say a little bit about what Shock can do for specific uh, discipline-based communities, as uh, sort of represented by uh, things like cost actions, where, where we're a sort of archae digital archaeology community, where our focus is on capacity building, helping uh, archaeologists think about digital archiving and digital reuse issues and, and helping uh, countries get up to speed in, in those. So that's one part of the question. And then obviously the second part is, is what would you like as a shock? What would you like from uh, groups like uh, Ciada. So I don't know uh, who wants to, to tackle that first. Let's see, we've got Ron on the on the line. Yeah, there. Ron. yeah. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Ron Decker here. I'm I'm the co coordinator of of Shock, and I'm also involved in this EOSC uh, executive board. Um, but the first, very nice presentation. So, so thank you for that. Some background on, on, on shock. It was a call by the European Commission to five clusters. And we, we always mention social sciences, humanities, but we, we were fully aware that, especially for heritage science, it, it goes through the whole spectrum. But the rules of EC uh, requested that it should be only in one cluster. You could only join one cluster. So that's the background why a cultural heritage uh, ended up in shock and not in, 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 in Panos or uh, another cluster. Uh, secondly, the five clusters um, have joined forces and we have regular meetings issues that are going on in, in this EOSC. And one of the, 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 the features of EOSC is um, to work on cross-domain data. Um, to say it bluntly, EOSC is desperately looking for use cases, examples that go cross-disciplinary, um, cross-domain, or that include uh, data uh, so content, network, storage, uh, computing, examples like this. If you would have uh, use cases uh, on, on this, and, and I think especially on working cross-domain, 
that would be very useful for shock, but also for me with my cap of, of EOSC on the attention of, say, Brussels. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's that's really helpful. Thank, thank you, Ron. Okay, there's any other uh, questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, Jesse Hendy has asked from the perspective of UK involvement, is it known how ERIS or shock will be affected by uh, Brexit? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I can partially answer uh, uh, that in that, uh, well, we are, uh, the, the shock project is, I think it, now Ron will correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but it's um, just shortly entering its second year, is that correct? Yeah, so it, the, uh, the UK participants in that, are, their continuation is guaranteed under the uh, agreement with the, with the EU. So for that length of, of time, we are, certain uh, but then in terms of the individual ERICs it's always depended uh, whether countries sign up to them the ERICs are the agreements for the uh, these uh, S3 uh, infrastructures uh, and uh, as far as I'm aware that does not depend upon whether you are a member of the of the EU and indeed members of ERIS had a, a meeting with uh, the representative from Bayes, the government department responsible for um, UK uh, involvement in ERICS, and he confirmed that the plan is for um, the UK to to be a founder partner within uh, e within ERIS uh, and to pay its subscription. And I think the from our perspective, from a UK perspective, these. Um, agreements become even more important post uh, Brexit so that we can continue to be involved in these uh, international uh, collaborations. Yeah. Yeah, if, if, if I may add, it is currently, uh, it's uh, still treating UK partners um, as, as part of, of uh, Horizon 2020 programme. If there is a, a Brexit and there is an agreement between the government, and, uh, th then it may still continue. And the agreement may be that UK uh, remains contributing to the Horizon uh, program. It may be that the UK will take care of the uh, UK part of the projects. So you won't get the money from EC, but from the UK. Only in the case of a hard Brexit and not a single agreement on dealing with projects, then there could be a hard stop that uh, all projects as of the da date of this hard exit uh, are no longer allowed to provide money to British partners. I, but we also got confirmation from the base, from the ministry, the, the, the UK ministry, that they intend to uh, keep on supporting European projects. Yeah, so I yeah. think for the moment, not, nothing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think there is an underwrite there in the event of a, of a hard Brexit, which, which we hope won't, won't happen. I think the question mark will be whether we continue to participate in Horizon Europe, because that will be subject to the, uh, the, the negotiations that are probably, unfortunately, currently stalled because of the crisis that everyone else is, is that we're all dealing with at the at the moment so we don't know what time scale they will resume on okay so uh, keith julian yes costis yeah uh, hi uh, hi i was wondering if i have a question related really to the work in the working group and uh, it's really to, it's to alejandra uh, so uh, I, I find it really really uh, important and interesting to see all these scientific data that relate to heritage, especially not only architectural heritage, which is very, very important, other fields as well, being somehow integrated and recycled uh, into reuse, both within this, uh, the disciplines, and clearly there's an interest to integrate such data 
most certainly in the case of archaeology and digital, especially digital archaeology. But I was wondering more generally, if you think of the reuse of these data uh, within the arts and humanities, uh, I know that still I many things are in progress, but I wonder how you envision them. How do you envision somebody from one of the disciplines in the arts and humanities using uh, this data? It's just like to as a brainstorm, you know, if you could share with us, you know, some of your ideas of how that, that might be possible. Thank you for the question, and I and I think I'd like to I'd like to open it to others also um, who might who might have uh, much more visionary ideas than than my own. Um, uh, for, well, one of the one of the challenges that I have experienced so far, for example, in in, in my own work, has been uh, the difficulty of, of reusing data that was collected, say, even even 10, 12 years ago, because it has then been processed by a, by some some software that uh, you've done some some analysis, and it's impossible to read that analysis with any other with any other software. Um, or the or the packet has uh, has been updated and now and now it's a, it's no longer usable and all you have are the PDF extracts that you made from it, which is which is a is a bit of a dysfunctional um, sort of outcome of, of 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 using digital data that you end up only with a printout of the analysis that you did, and and for me it would be fantastic if we could move on from that if we could. Uh, ensure that uh, that stops happening, um, um, and uh, and I think there's there's lots of things happening uh, in that in that regards uh, interoperable uh, formats and um, uh, but but I th I guess um, with the development of of, of uh, proprietary software, uh, it's also been very much a protection. Uh, tool hasn't it to to uh to make sure that people use your software and not and not others but but i think that is changing i think the mentality is changing um that's that's my my short <laughs> contribution to your very open question and very in, in, interesting and exciting question and i wonder if anyone else anyone else wants to contribute I don't know, Ron, whether you wanted to come back in. You posted a, uh, a comment in the chat bar. Yeah, I, I think it's it's on, on data, um, but it's also on, on software and tools. And as, as I wrote, your community, I think, is, is used to work interoperable. And to, to say it in, in, in a nice Dutch way, uh, most disciplines don't have a clue what that means. Mm -hmm. So bringing in this expertise is already contributing. Um, on on data it it can be um in in unexpected directions we we had a discussion with panosk with the esrf in grenoble and and they have these collections of animals or uh, skeletons or uh, x-rays uh, i think they have uh, big collections of uh, no that was eos live on on uh, archaeologic, uh, archaeological material on skulls. And these can be used by other disciplines for totally different purposes. So I think the cataloging of what you have on date, uh, on type of data is, is very important because it will bring ideas to, to other people. I think biologists would be very interested in the collection of ESRF, uh, what they have on x-rays. Okay, thank thank you, uh, uh, Ron. I think we're we're running into the next paper, but I think we'll we will we've got some discussion time later. So we we'll, we will take a, quite an interesting question that Keith uh, raised. Do you want to uh, uh, pose it, Keith? Uh, I've lost it again. Sorry, I'm, I've, I've I'm so busy chatting to loads of people on the chat. <laughs> Sorry, that uh, on the spot there. Not, can, can I, you say a bit more? You, you, I looked on your website, so I looked up about, about the, the survey of vocabularies the, that you've put up on the website. It looks interesting, just because I know a couple of colleagues that I've worked with 
go into and we've done a lot of work on trying to map in vocabularies and doing scos versions you know linked open data versions of vocabularies is that is that something you can say a little bit more about what what your aims are in that i'm not directly involved with that aspect of 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 the work and i wonder if any of the other uh shock members uh may be more directly working on this hmm. what we have done in, uh, at cesda also as part of shock is to to set up a, <coughs> a a website where you can manage the vocabularies so it's up to each community or discipline to to decide on uh, controlled vocabularies and they, they can be managed using this tool in a way uh, which is called uh, controlled vocabulary services um, so it's it's more like providing a platform where you can store these uh, vocabularies and then they they will keep up um, and available from that website so that, that that's only one application um, yeah it, everybody's mentioning uh, COVID-19 and, and one of the issues you can see in the vocabularies is that the different scientific domains are setting up the, the thesauri or the vocabularies on, on this topic and it would be good to to align over over disciplines and I think this this could also be the case as as you have expertise not specifically on COVID, but on other topics where you could say, okay, uh, we are aware of these vocabularies. Th th that would be a, a first step, just to have an inventory of, of what, what is around there. Thank you. Yeah. My follow up to Julian then is how does that relate to the Ariadne stuff? Yeah, I was just about to comment on, on, on that. And I think that is, it. thanks for that Q, because that's an Im important point, I think. The, the, the work particularly that we're doing in Ariadne, well, and particularly that Doug and Kerry, who I think I think I saw Doug was still on the on the line, are, are leading on, and then all partners are contributing to in the mapping. I think I mean, we tend to develop these within our own domain islands in in a way, and we've encountered this as we've moved beyond our sort of core area of archaeology. For example, in in as you're familiar with, in period terms where the architects have different terminologies uh, for, for buildings descriptions. And I think therefore it, it is the, the, the work that Shock are doing that would then not repeat what we're doing, but would provide lists of the vocabularies used within our domain. It would then enable interoperability, hopefully, uh, when we want to address some of these big challenge questions like COVID that cross over uh, so many disciplines. Um, it would allow us to to increase interoperability through open link data and so forth. So I think that's my uh, sort of response to, to that. Yeah, does that help? Um, that helps me. Yeah, I don't know if Doug has it, but just awareness of it is very useful. So I'll have another look at it on the website. Obviously, I haven't had a chance to really read what's actually up there. I just saw yeah. it as I went in. Just to pitch in on our side in um, Ariadne, Ariadne Plus, we've been looking to map vocabularies at um, quite a, a detailed level of granularity, trying to be able to support um, search at, um, at some you know, level of specificity. We've been mapping up to a, a hub vocabulary, the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus for subject terms, um, as a sort of broad umbrella uh, uh, vocabulary. Um, but um, looking to be able to map um, at quite a detailed level um to support search so i think it depends on the kinds of mappings and kinds of use cases that you're you're looking for for um for doing mappings there's different different types of mappings that are uh, that are possible mm. and i think there's a there's a, a particular relevance to this uh, group with the, the crossover as well with the, not just the sort of buildings but with the natural sciences just obviously there's been a lot of work on control vocabularies and for um, the, the natural sciences, isn't there, in terms of, of SCOS definitions, which for archaeologists is often important where you want to reference species. So there's no point in us repeating that, but through open link data, we can, can reference those definitions. Yes, very much.
yeah thanks well I, th I think we should probably move on if holly's ready to talk about the recommendations that you were making for eris on uh, data policy do you want to to go ahead holly Can you see it? Uh, yes, you're. Uh, yeah, you're not in presenter mode yet. How's that? Yeah, that's that's perfect. Right. So I'm just going to really quickly run through, uh, just give you an introduction to what Seattle is doing, which we've already just mentioned, uh, Ariadne Plus. Um, so it'll give you a little bit of background on that and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in ERIS and, and I apologize this is going to be uh, just a really quick <laughs> introduction to, to these things but I'm hoping that you can see in relation to shock how these things all fit together. They're weirdly they're all on sort of the same timelines as well <laughs> so they're all happening at the same time. Um, and there's just, I think there's a lot of overlap and with that there's a lot of opportunity right now. So um, first I'll start talking about SIADA. So uh, why, why did SIADA come into existence? Um, well, basically we were working on the Ariadne, the first phase of the Ariadne project, uh, which was an EU FP7 project under the infrastructure theme. And when we started, we had 23 partners across 16 countries, and that was archaeological and technical partners. Uh, we finished the first four year phase in January of 2017. And there was a whole, there was a really wide variety of work packages, many of which were just straight research. But the primary thing that we needed to deliver as part of the pro uh, project was a collection level metadata aggregation portal. Um, PIN were the coordinators and we were the deputy coordinators. And this is just a quick screenshot of what the portal looks like. Um, it's a very simple what, where, when uh, interface which belies the incredible complexity <laughs> underneath, um, both in terms of uh, the technology but also the collaborative uh, effort that had to go into it. Um, but what was what was really interesting about Ariadne is that it also very much uh, was a community. So there were ITC organizations, the archaeological organizations. We also, by the end of the first phase, had 15 associate partners uh, who wanted to be data providers. Uh, that number has gone up uh, significantly. Um, but and but we had aspects of community building that were built into the project. But they were all, you know, including special interest groups, training events, things like that, but they were all outwardly facing. So what, what happened was essentially um, it was sort of triggered by this paper that was given by our partners in Slovenia and Ireland, where they, they basically said that being part of the Ariadne project and community had led them to really realize the degree to which there were some countries that were haves and some countries that were have nots when it came to having an acceptable place for their archaeological data to go. Um, and that they felt very much, Slovenia and Ireland, they felt were very much have nots. And so we started thinking about the fact that maybe we need to do some internal capacity building. So we decided to uh, offer some data management plans uh, or data management workshops to partners in their own countries and cobble together a little bit of funding because obviously there was no funding within Ariadne because it hadn't been envisioned. Um, and Austria and Slovenia both accepted and uh, what happened was really quite interesting. So um, here's a, uh, an example. This is the data management work workshop in Vienna. Um, essentially, I and uh, Kate Fernie, who is another one of the Ariadne partners, had agreed to volunteer our time to come and 
and do the data management workshops. But I think what really made them work um, was the fact that the local partners uh, worked, first of all, really, really hard to make sure that all of the key stakeholders uh, were in the room uh, for the workshop. And then they did something which I think was incredibly brave, which was they uh, presented in their national language what they felt was the current state of play in their country with regards to what is happening with our with our data um, which was sort of uh, which was brave as i say because it was not necessarily it's not necessarily something that you want to <laughs> that people necessarily want to hear and to get up and say you know here's the problem that we have um, but what we found was that people were really hungry for this information, which was kind of surprising because data management workshops are not the most exciting part of archaeology. Um, and when we were asking people, why are, why are you so you know, desperate for this information? So they were all getting pressure now from funders to deposit their data. Uh, there are pressures, perhaps from your own institution, that you've got to deposit your data in an open repository. And, and funding wasn't even necessarily the issue, because in both instances, there was funding available, but there was no guidance on what to do. And, and more importantly, there, was no, there were no appropriate options for archaeological data. So, you know, libraries, organizations that are used to dealing with textual documents, they don't know what to do with a GIS file necessarily. And they certainly don't know how to make sure a GIS file is still uh, usable in, in five or 10 years time. So, um, and archeologists, we use absolutely every sort of research methodology uh, that can help answer our questions. So we use, we use absolutely everything. Um, so we continued, based on these six, what seemed like a really successful formula, we continued to have conversations about how to take this expertise, take this community uh, outside of the area and partnership and collaborate beyond our current network. And what we realized was that, yes, there's general good practice, but in terms of the uh, specific kind of uh, funding, political, whatever landscape in each country or region or institution that one size absolutely did not fit all and that working together was the only way we were going to actually move the conversation forward. And, and archaeology in particular has some specific challenges that make this really important. Um, so archaeological data often are derived from non-repeatable interventions. So if you excavate an archaeological site, you destroy that site and all of that careful documentation that archaeologists do, uh, that then becomes the primary data. Um, and, but at the same time, we're all doing much more of our work in, in digital formats and digital data is much more fragile and subject to obsolescence. So when you, and, and you really, most people really don't think about the fact that five, uh, you know, are you still using the same hardware and software that you used five years ago, maybe 10 years ago? Absolutely not. And that's really what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, potentially losing an entire generation of archaeological knowledge to the digital dark age. So it, there is a real urgency, particularly for archaeology. So we decided to write a cost action to try to put this, uh, try to do something about this. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with cost actions, um, they are networking grants uh, for meetings, training sessions, um, publications, things like that. Uh, right now we have, uh, we're up to 33 countries participating. So in addition to cost countries, which is broadly, um, continental Europe. Uh, we also have partners from or members from uh, Canada, the US, Argentina, Japan, and Iran. Um, and it also is meant to complement uh, a cost action that's just coming to an end right now called ARC work, uh, which has been looking at archaeological knowledge practice. And this little graph right here is just um, something that our, our joint scientific officer put together to show the different connections between the, all of the different cost actions going on in, the, uh, in cultural heritage right now. So there, there are a lot. Um, so CIATA has uh, research coordination objectives. Um, 
basically understanding what is the state of the art, developing common understandings, and then obviously we want to move this into a range of fundable research projects so that we can actually take things forward. Um, capacity building objectives as well, uh, fostering knowledge exchange, um, increasing representation of women. Uh, currently we're at 43% of our management committee and I'd like to see that at 50. Um, extending capacity and uh, working, with, uh, working with other leading initiatives like shock and like uh, heroes. So um, the way that SEATA is actually structured is uh, through four different working groups. And the idea was that the working groups would be, it didn't matter where you were in trying to take action about how to deal with your archeological data, there would be one that would fit for you. Um, so the first one is just stewardship. So I, we've got, we have a problem we, but, and we want to do something about it. How do we actually start? How do we start having the conversations? Um, planning for archiving is just completely practical. Okay, we've decided to make a start. We've got a little bit of money. What do we actually do? How do what's the software we should use? Just what are, what are the practical challenges? Working group three uh, is uh, best practice and very much about building a community of, of the actual archivists who do this work. So you already have a repository set up. How do you, how do you uh, continue that best practice discussion and move it forward? And then uh, what I think is going to be our work for the next 10 years, which is basically understanding uh, what use and reuse looks like, which is why we're all here today. Um, basically, uh, it's not just enough to make the data open. We need to understand in not just a quantitative way, but a qualitative way, how the data is being reused so that we can start working towards uh, best practice in that area as well. Um, activities, we have surveys, workshops, um, scientific missions, publications, and because it's cost action, you can get involved at any time. So uh, if you are interested in getting involved, there are different ways to get in touch with us. We've got a Twitter account, which is Seattle underscore cost and a website, seattle.eu. And then finally, I'll just say uh, Ariadne, we're now in the second phase of Ariadne, which is now called Ariadne Plus. This time it's 41 partners in 28 countries. Uh, primarily this time uh, they are archeological partners, so data providers. Um, but one of the key things for, for today is that uh, Ariadne Plus is definitely uh, extending thematic coverage of which um, heritage science is one, archeological science. Um, and that, I will leave that there. And obviously if you have any questions about Seattle, please get in touch with me. Julian, should I just go on to the next one? Yeah, I think you should go straight on to uh, straight on. We'll take the, any, any questions together. Yeah. Are you able to see that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So another thing that we've been working on um, in terms of our tasks within the ERIS project, uh, within Work Package 5, which is access and interoperability policies, uh, this is this is we're in just finishing up the three-year pre preparatory phase for ERIS. So this is all about uh, setting things up and creating policies. Um, and within task, task 5.3 is data curation. And as part of that task, um, so this is what the task actually is. So understanding data creation and creating policy. Uh, we were required to write a deliverable, which isn't quite uh, due or completed yet, but we are most of the way, uh, most of the way forward on it. So. Um, Basically, it is looking at data curation policy. It reviews issues around data curation for heritage science. 
Uh, it's providing basically a policy framework that EROOS can use for the heritage science domain. And it follows the uh, FAIR principles, which I don't know that we've actually defined what those, I'm, I'm assuming most people know what the FAIR principles are, but if not, um, there are a set of principles that were uh, published in 2016, I think, basically saying that all data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And to my mind, the really important thing about that is I now consider those things to be of equal importance. Um, and basically uh, in incorporating that into heritage science. Um, basically, the report, so that's what the main part of the report contains, but then there's an equally large, if not larger, number of examples uh, within an appendix in the report trying to look at the actual range of heritage science data types uh, that are out there. So um, it was, I'm going to run through all 33 uh, policy points very quickly. Um, Julian is going to, uh, in the discussion afterwards, he's pulled out some particular points uh, that it would be great to have a discussion around, but I'll just run through them all really quickly first. So within findability, um, basically ERA's repositories needs, need to use persistent identifiers, uh, should provide information about best practice and data citation. Uh, ERA's users should reg register for an ORCID, which is a persistent identifier for you as a researcher. Um, ERA should build communities to develop uh, metadata schemas and standards, which we've already talked about a little bit. Uh, for accessibility, ERA should ensure heritage science research data is accessible and retrievable. It should work to create and sustain appropriate repositories uh, and help them obtain appropriate certifications so they can become trusted repositories. Uh, consider legal requirements, policies, and ethics pro protocols as applicable. Uh, they should make they should work to make data access open whenever possible. If data can't be made open, at least the metadata should be, which at least allows people to know that the data exists and where to find it. Um, the repository should make the metadata, metadata publicly accessible and harvestable by search engines, which will improve accessibility and should be using standardized protocols. Under accessibility, uh, ERA should maintain and publish a registry of protocol endpoints as part of DigiLab, which Julian mentioned already, uh, should support new and developing repositories and should report, support repositories that make data associated with publications more accessible because that's the thing that we really should be working towards is actually linking our data to our synthesis. Um, interoperability, basically supporting interoperability standards so that are both human and machine readable, provide, uh, promoting active standards-based user development communities, uh, publishing metadata models, which again, we've already talked a little bit about, um, documenting technical specifications for those metadata models, defining classes and properties, uh, determining what are man mandatory. Uh, files held in repositories should be in open formats, standardized formats, and researchers should be using preferred formats recommended by ERAs. Uh, and independent of, so non-proprietary whenever possible. Under reusability, uh, should ensure heritage science research data is ready for future research processing. Uh, researchers and labs should ensure their data is systematically documented. Uh, they should ensure that they're maintaining version control and follow precise and consistent file naming conventions. Uh, should develop guidelines recommending standard, uh, standardized file formats, metadata requirements, and uh, permitting the widest reuse possible in terms of uh, licenses. Um, should adopt uh, Creative Commons licensing, um, and at least the metadata should be CC0, so completely open to reuse, and data sets by default should be CC by, so open but with attribution. And then we added a couple more just around data management planning. So completion of a data management plan uh, should be a requirement. And uh, we felt that rather than reinventing the wheel, uh, the Parthenos project has already created a very nice lightweight data management template, which could certainly be used by ERAs going forward. Uh, so the appendix um, was basically just trying to get our heads around 
what the different workflows were in heritage science because they are so different. Um, and basically we looked, we, we tried to put it into different pieces of the workflow. So first we just looked at overview and planning. Why are you creating the data? Are there limitations? What do you think the reuse will be? Who do you think the audience is? Um, what are the needs for preserving the data? What kind of preparation do you need to do? And then we went on to collection and creation. Uh, what is the raw data? Um, what cleaning has been undertaken? What kinds of formats are you using? Uh, what are your equipment settings, which I think most people are quite used to making sure is part of their data? Um, what are the protocols? Um, processing, uh, basically what are, what's the policy uh, after post acquisition about your, the, uh, above during the collection phase? Are there policy or protocol documents? Are there any intermediate da intermediary data sets that are important for understanding the final data? Um, are there other versions of the data that maybe are, have been created for different purposes? And then as far as the long-term curation, what kinds of files and formats are suitable? Uh, is the final, are you sure that you have the final data set? <laughs> Um, what is the structure? Is there any meaningful structure that we need to know about in order to understand that data? And these were uh, the different methodologies where we were able to get people to try to go through and answer all those questions. So uh, we had a few in spectroscopy and material analysis. We had some in microscopy. We only got one dating method. Um, some biolecular methods and Jesse very kindly has, has helped us with that. Um, synchrotron methods and and that was it so if people are interested in potentially an trying to answer some of those questions and building out this appendix so that we can really understand what your methodologies are and what uh, what the workflow is for your data that would be fantastic and I'll leave it there thank you thank you uh, Holly very much I want to uh, to stop sharing your screen now thanks that's great um okay so and while you were talking ron has uh, posted a, a link to uh, an overview on implementing fair from the dataverse project so uh, i've not from, i haven't seen that myself so i will look out for for that that might be uh, useful to us thank you ron um so um first of all just check if uh, there are any uh, specific questions for Holly as she as she mentioned we've got some points that we'd like to raise for discussion before we go into those are there any points of clarification sorry sorry it was so rushed yeah no that's that's fine it's a lot of bullet points to get through <laughs> Okay, um, so if you go uh, back up to the top of the shared Google Doc, uh, we've not put them all, there were obviously 32 recommendations in total for, for ERIS on data policy, but we've, we've just posted a sample there of ones that um, we'd like some reaction from. Now you don't necessarily have to react to these now. We're going to leave the document open and you can go away and think about them and add some comments under the different uh, headings. Um, but it, we thought this was an opportunity whilst we've got a, a representative sample, we hope, of the heritage science community together to before we finalize these recommendations which i guess we're going to be doing in the next two or three weeks to then submit the deliverable it's an opportunity for us to get some feedback and i suppose what we'd be looking for particularly if there are things here that you say oh uh, i don't think that would work for my particular area of heritage science uh, what do they mean by that it would be good to uh, either get your reactions uh, verbally now or uh, to uh, 
uh, write something under those headings and I've sort of prompted some initial questions as as there or already there but does anyone want to come in and see see Lisa you've put your camera on does that mean that you wanted to uh, to say something <laughs> Oh, you're very quiet. Better? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I was just wondering if you've engaged with the National Heritage Science Forum. Um, they are a UK-wide organisation that's made up of a lot of different member organisations. Historic Environment Scotland is one. They're all heritage scientists from universities, museums, huge amount of background. And I think that some of your questions actually might be re do really well being put to them if you haven't already engaged with them because they're going to be the people who have all the data as well as the folks who are, want to interrogate it in different ways. Okay, thank, thank you for that suggestion. We haven't engaged with them directly on this, but that's a, a, a good idea. We do. We've got. You said it's a Heritage Science Forum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're called the NHSF, the National Heritage Science Forum. And at the moment, they're working up their kind of global challenges and they're looking at the impact and how they measure the impact of their of the data that they're producing. And I think you guys are well equipped to help them with that. That sounds perfect. Thank you. Thanks. So, so I'll just I'll just sort of prompt discussion on on a, a, a few of these. If there are no reactions, we'll we'll move on uh, but first of all under findability of the fair principles we've written this recommendation that that ERIs should really be building communities to develop relevant metadata schemes and standards for heritage science i suppose one of the first questions there is well where are the are the gaps are there areas that are um, are already adequately covered do we need any more metadata schemas for Heritage science is it adequately covered by things as things like the the, the fish uh, archaeological sciences thesaurus I think but uh, uh, but are there other schemes coming maybe metadata schemes from the hard sciences that we might not know about that we should be linking to anyone want to to comment I'm going to butt in again, sorry. Um, I think that all the ones that are looking at um, ancient DNA specifically, because I think they're quite good at the way that they're collecting their data and presenting it. When we did the ancient DNA database for Scotland, we actually didn't bother even attempting to import it in, in the raw format that basically there are quite a lot of um, of online repositories where they're putting all of this information and I think that they all have a standardized way of collecting that data. Thanks. Is, Jesse, is that the one that you mentioned to us that, that BioArt used? It's not specifically one that BioArt uses, it's one that's common to not just in the fields of ancient DNA but across the fields of molecular biology. I'll talk about this actually more specifically in my um, presentation. Yeah. Okay, thanks. What about the um, the sort of engineering and construction side of, of, of heritage science? Maybe this is a question for Alejandra and, and, and Scott, because this is an area we're unfamiliar with. There are obviously archeological vocabularies for building recording, uh, but are there control vocabularies and, and uh, schemas for, that you're familiar with? And Hannah and I might be able to speak to different parts of this. I think she deals more in the structural side and I uh, know perhaps a bit more about the um, surveying and building management side. Uh, to be honest, there is recording standards when it comes to building management, but building information modeling as a whole is quite a rapidly developing area. And a lot of what is in the ISO standards and other standards right now is kind of an idealistic best practice. Uh, a lot of which people who, even in, in developing those or in implementing them in industrial or uh, heritage organization contexts, acknowledge that they're not feasible right now. So to the extent that there is demonstrated success, I'm not sure, uh, but it's definitely something to think about and keep an eye on. Okay, thanks. Did you want to add anything, Alejandra? 
I can add a little bit on the on sort of some of the more scientific um, aspects of of uh, building analysis that I that I work with, um, and uh, and there the the. Um, sort of the advantage is that, for example, in, in structural analysis, the vocabulary is, is very well defined and, and used in a very consistent and very robust way by the, by the community. Um, so so um, that, that is, in a way, um, advantageous. Uh, there's already a lot of um, um, sort of agreement on the uh, and good use of the of the vocabulary but i have to say that i haven't engaged actively with with other um uh, sort of more um hard science um uh platforms or or initiatives working on 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 data so so i don't know what they're up to okay maybe that's something that we need to to Just to pick up on building information modeling and vocabularies, they use a, a system called Uniclass, which doesn't doesn't really cover the historic environment, the, the, the built heritage at all. And um, the, 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 the monument thesauri, the, the components thesauri that, that are developed in fish in the UK, there's no 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 exact mapping across between between the the, the monument th the, the the archaeological terminologies and the the BIM uni class um, they, uh, they they mix their concepts so we we would have a lintel as a component they would have a concrete lintel as a as a value so uh, there's a lot of work to be done there to to, to make our vocabularies work with uh, building modeling okay that thanks peter that's useful because i think we, so in the uk we're aware that that this BIM building information modeling is being used increasingly by by archaeological contractors as uh, as well for because it's adopted by large construction consortia such as those involved with with high speed two so GIS are still relevant but but BIM is the new acronym we all have to learn and I wondered whether that's the case overseas we've got quite a few of our European CIADA members on the line does does BIM mean anything to any of you when when there is there are big archaeological infrastructure projects silence <laughs> i'm going to i'm going to pick on a few <laughs> people see see whether they're still uh, uh, listening and, and awake. Uh, Wolfgang, it, 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 is, is BIM used at all? Have you come across it in, uh, in uh, German archaeology? BIM? I don't even know what it means. Right. Okay. Yeah. Building information modeling. It's, uh, yeah. It's, it seems to be a 3D for, I mean, Peter and others will know more about it or Kieran if he's on the line, but it's a sort of in a way, a, a 3D version of GIS that uh, covers the, uh, the sort of built environment. Jesse, do you want to say anything about this message you sent to me about the EMBL? Sure, it was just a comment really to say that another, a big um, data repository uh, is the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Um, they host a number of different kinds of databases and control things like um, different ontologies for using particular languages in, in, the, in the natural sciences, molecular sciences. So I just wanted to draw, draw your attention to that. Um, it's linked in a sense to archaeology by acting as a repository for some ancient DNA and ancient protein data. Okay, thanks. Just added that to the Google Doc. Yeah, and uh, I see Jenny, oh, Jenny O'Brien has, has added a link to a, a very topical one to the World Health Organization International Classification of Diseases. Uh, okay, are there, are there any other questions that people are, are picking up on here? I'm going to sort of jump to, jump to the bottom and ask about licensing of data to so we're making this recommendation that metadata for heritage science should always be cc0 so it should be 
completely open, can do what you like with it. Uh, but and then for data sets that they should be at least CC by by default. So if you if you're not familiar with these Creative Commons licenses, uh, CC by means basically you can do what you like with it as long as you acknowledge the uh, the source of it. So it's like you you might do in a traditional sort of publication where you reference your your source with a bibliographic reference. Um, uh, but that the data should be completely open, which obviously for EU funding and other funding sources is is often a requirement, unless there are particular confidentiality issues. And we encounter these a little bit in archaeology with uh, issues of site looting and um, uh, exact geographic locations of, of sites. And so they they can often be exceptions. But my question is, is there anything in the sort of heritage science domain that we need to be aware of where CC BY would not be appropriate for the sort of confidentiality issues? Um, there, there are regularly confidentiality issues in, in, in certain types of um, um, heritage science research in particular that so when we talk about heritage science we also include social science research related to heritage and there you do come across lots of um, uh, um, person, personal information of, of um, either collected um, related to questionnaires or other type of, of social science uh, research methods uh, so in that respect we we share some of their some of their um, sort of concerns and some of their limitations in in terms of um, anonymity and um, um, I think that's that's the main thing that that comes to mind. Scott, yeah, you want to add to that? Um, yeah, just very briefly, I think. Um, across the world, whenever a collection, or indeed perhaps also in archaeological contexts, um, anything to do with um, indigenous um, artifacts or rituals. Uh, there's, you know, museums have very established protocols when it comes to how to deal with those and who can handle that. And I don't know about the current state of discourse when it comes to the affiliated data or digital representations of that heritage. But certainly, I think it would be worth drawing on the museum sector's experience in how to handle that and what are appropriate uh, approaches to that and, and how to engage with communities when it comes to dealing with data and potential reuse and access. Yeah, thanks. thanks. That's an important uh, uh, point. And we mentioned it in the first day of the workshop that there, is, that there are these care principles as, as well for... Uh, uh, indigenous peoples that have been developed in the in the US. Yeah, we should we should reference those. Uh, Costis, did you want to comment on that? Uh, actually, and uh, thanks, thanks Julian for reminding us that we did mention uh, CARE yesterday. And I'm just going back to CARE exactly, because I mean, the context there is this alliance, Indigenous Data Alliance, obviously, that set up uh, CARE, these principles about collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility and ethics anyway, towards data. And it's particularly relevant in the indigenous context. However, these principles, I think, they're generalizable. Because I'm thinking of kinds of information, for instance, that relate, uh, imagine, for instance, information that is about the built environment in general, information that has to do with uh, uh, projects in which, uh, uh, in the ways in which uh, archaeological evidence is going to be uh, preserved in case of major building projects or infrastructural projects. In all those cases, sometimes local communities, or in some other cases, also uh, what we call, you know, these, these communities that are source communities, that people who are related to particular heritages, I'm thinking of contemporary archaeology or recent archaeology, for instance, uh, archaeology of the recent past, might be relevant. And uh, I think that uh, we should give consideration to some of these. Uh, you asked uh, Julian if there are cases, for instance, in which uh, 
privacy issues or issues of uh, controlling access might be exercised. And I could think of uh, cases, for instance, in architectural heritage, very often this information, structural information that is assembled, does not belong necessarily centrally to the state. It is information that is deposited through a process of approval, for instance. In Greece, I know that this is the case. All structural plans for buildings and all this kind of information about buildings has to be deposited uh, with the, the state uh, in order to gain permission in order to build. But this is not public information. There is information about uh, uh, private houses and the layouts of private houses. I imagine that this is private. I can imagine information about uh, human remains, uh, uh, scientific information about human remains in specific communities to be something that needs to be given a different level of uh, access, uh, especially if we're talking about the recent past. I mean, we know that we have uh, records that could trace, people could trace back ancestry several generations. What if we have an excavation, 19th century cemetery excavation, an early 20th century uh, excavation or something like that? So I think that uh, we should probably give more uh, uh, space for consideration of uh, the care principles, transforming them and transferring them to the broader situation in which there are communities, there is local knowledge and ways in which we need to respect and give it equal a footing with regard to interpreting both archaeological data but also archaeological science data and all these other terms that uh, um, care uh, sets uh, on the ground on these principles collective benefit authority to control responsibility uh, and ethics thank, thank you uh, costas that's really helpful and uh, i'd like actually to ask on uh, on paolo Luc lucy who was a, a ciada recently on a ciada short-term scientific mission to uh, uh, to the UK in, in ADS until he had to go back to Sardinia because of the uh, of COVID-19 but we're really pleased that he he got home okay but he's um, carrying on this theme of skeletal remains in the chat uh, Bob. Paolo are you there do you want to expand on your comments? We can see you your microphone's muted Okay, does doesn't look like the uh, your sounds uh, uh, working, but nice to see you. So uh, I don't know if anyone's read uh, Paolo's comment that uh, that uh, the the most open form of CC licensing could be uh, excessive, could be problematic with skeletal remains and particularly three D uh, models. Um, I mean, yeah, and I think this will be a problem with with some of the large um cemetery excavations that have been going on in advance of high speed two for example the sort of 60 000 burials at euston station that have been excavated that for, for many of them there are uh, uh, identity of the of the people buried is is known so obviously that needs sensitive handling and uh, uh lisa you said that people are thinking about this at the moment in scotland are they, are they what are the sorts of uh, conclusions they're drawing about particularly about the digital images no oh, you're muted but nice to see your cat yes apologies to you. she likes to get in on all of my videos um yeah i and um, we it's just really we're something really at the, at the start of the process and um, because we're looking at treatment of human remains policy but we're trying to make it much more wide reaching so we look at transport of human remains as well as what happens with um images with samples that are being taken for um for dna analysis what happens when samples are not used it links to a lot of um, human tissues acts in scotland that came into effect more recently um, so we're really just kind of starting that process, which is obviously on hold at the moment, but working quite closely with the Surgeons Hall Museum um, in Edinburgh and, and looking at display, transport, sampling, as well as what we're doing with the data. And um, we're taking the widest possible stance on that. So looking at um, display of human remains in all formats, not just so the digital scans, but also looking at um, as well as that photographs um, and then the human remains themselves. But I'm I'm happy to keep you updated. Um, I, we really are just at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. When you when you sort of publish a policy on that, that would be uh, useful. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay. 
I don't want to sort of hog the the questions here. So if there's a question from Doa. In the, oh, in, yeah. the, in the chat. Yeah. So, so most colonial period buildings in Pakistan are still being used by government or security institutions. Oh yes, this is yeah, and I think we, yeah, we've had issues in the UK as well about uh, MOD buildings that may have been uh, listed but or, or still in in use there. So yeah, that's an, that's a good point. That's another area that probably affects many countries where there may be limitations about what could be made available. Well, okay, well, I'll just, we're coming up to lunch time, but um, I'll just, I'll just pick up one of the other questions, unless there's anything else, particularly Holly, that you wanted to, to get further input from. Uh, Kieran's just posted an interesting comment as well. It's in, it's in the chat. All right, yes, he, he's not going to speak, yeah. Yeah, so, just, all right, yeah, so again, this is picking up. On, on 3D data and concerns with that. Yeah, might be an area we need to highlight the, the 3D representations. Uh, well, the, the, I suppose the last question I uh, had was we've made this sort of statement, ERIS should work to create and sustain appropriate ERIS repositories. Uh, and a number have been mentioned, and it's a question of sort of how we define these. And so my question goes to uh, uh, repository accreditation and uh, data seal of approval and now core trust seal seems to be a sort of international standard that certainly uh, where there are a number of repositories are working towards. Um, would that, if we said that an appropriate repository had to have the core trust seal, would that be too limiting at the moment for heritage science or are the appropriate repositories that people have mentioned, are they covered by core trust seal or an equivalent accreditation process? Anyone uh, know? I think we're ready for lunch. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like it. <laughs> okay, that's well, let's draw a close on the uh, this morning's discussion then. Uh, so, uh, thanks again to uh, Alejandra for introducing uh, Shock and to Holly for introducing Ciada and the uh, ERIS recommendations. As I say, we will leave this document open. Uh, so, if you have any comments, so by the end of the week, uh, please add them in, but we'll take on board uh, what we've said this morning and, and uh, do a little bit of refining and footnoting there. Um, so uh, we now have uh, an hour break for uh, lunch. And so I'm going to close the uh, Zoom session down, uh, but I'll reopen it about 10 to, or rather, um, yeah, 20 past rather, 20 past one, it's 20 past two Central European time. Um, and we've got a, another pair of papers and it'll be the same link again to join it. So thanks very much everyone, bye for now. <laughs>